Well, welcome. Tonight, we're going to talk to somebody that is looking to fill a very important office, but one that you don't hear a lot about. So we're going to try and talk about the different roles and the effects, and just generally get to know a new candidate. Why don't we start with an introduction? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Shannon List Reardon. I am very excited to be running to be Massachusetts next Attorney General. I have spent my entire legal career, more than 23 years, fighting and winning big cases on behalf of working people. I have represented workers for my whole career. Um, I've led teams of lawyers and made national headlines, taking on some of the largest and most powerful corporations in America, companies like Starbucks, FedEx, Uber, Amazon, IBM, my alma mater, Harvard University, which I've sued at least four times. I have recovered hundreds of millions of dollars for working people that was stolen from them by their employers. In the process, I have shaped our legal landscape here in Massachusetts and across the country to make our laws more protective for working people. I am very excited about this opportunity now to step into the shoes of our attorney, current Attorney General and continue and expand on the important work she's been doing, fighting for consumers, fighting for workers, fighting to protect our environment. I am very proud to have the support of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO and more than 50 individual labor unions who together represent more than a half a million working people. So thank you so much for having me tonight. I look forward to talking with you about this race. I've got to think that at your reunion, you're probably not the most um, positively accepted person by your alma mater. Oh, if you uh, sued them four times. They, ta they taught me well. They taught me well. I held them accountable. Um, uh, and, and that's what I've done through my career. I have not hesitated to take on any battle where someone's not living up to the law. And I have even the playing field for regular people who can't afford fancy high-priced lawyers. Um, I've, I've used the law step by step to, to make people's lives better. That's why I went to law school, um, and that's why I'm excited now to be in this race to be Massachusetts Next People's Lawyer. We start all of our shows with the basic question. Shannon, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? You should vote for me because I am by far the most experienced and qualified candidate who is running to be the next Attorney General. I have been widely recognized as one of the most effective lawyers in America. Um, I, have, I have strengthened the law to help regular people. Um, I've evened the playing field. I have won the jury trials. I have won the appeals that have helped make our laws uh, more fairly serve the people. And this is a really critical time. We have so many things that are happening, so many priorities that are facing us, and we have a U.S. Supreme Court that has been ripping apart our rights on a federal level. So that puts a lot of focus and responsibility now on the states, and particularly on state attorneys general. Um, I have spent my career working through the law creatively, using the legal system to improve people's lives. I've, I've spent my career getting around bad Supreme Court decisions, and we need a seasoned, experienced lawyer in that office who knows how to protect our rights here in Massachusetts, um, our reproductive rights, um, our, our voting rights, our rights to um, fight climate change and, and protect our future and our planet for our children and our grandchildren. Um, we need someone who will enforce the great laws that we have on the books here in Massachusetts. We have a legislature that has put some pretty strong laws on the books. Massachusetts has some of the most protective laws in the country uh, to help workers, to help consumers, but I know from my years of practice that laws don't enforce themselves. We need an experienced lawyer who knows how to do that, and that's, that's why people should vote for me as an ex-Attorney General. Attorney General. What is the definition and the mission of the Attorney General's office? Because you never hear about it till there's a big case come up. Or... The Attorney General is the people's lawyer. So I, I have effectively been a private Attorney General for more than 20 years. I've been enforcing the laws 
through my private practice, and I look forward to continuing expanding on this work with the power of the state behind me. The Attorney General's office does things like recovers wages that have been stolen from working people. Um, I'm planning on setting up a fund so that if people don't get paid properly by their employers, they can go to the AG's office and they get paid that money back right away while the AG's office goes after bad actors who are stealing wages. As it works now, you have to wait weeks, months, even years for these cases to be investigated. But um, look at how our unemployment system works or our workers' comp system works. So those folks don't need to wait months or years to get their money. Um, the consumer protection is an extremely important but part Shannon, of the office. Yes. If when you say money stolen, is that just I didn't get paid the right amount? I... Yes. Yes. It, there is a, a serious problem of wage theft in this country. There are employers. Um, a lot of big corporations save money on labor costs by by cheating their workers out of all the money that they're owed. And there are a lot of companies out there now that are not just not just not paying, you know, for every hour worked, which is pretty bad, but they are trying to avoid all of our employment laws altogether by misclassifying workers as independent contractors. So in particular, there are these big tech companies that have been doing this, uh, companies like Uber, or Lyft, DoorDash, Grubhub. Um, I have taken on these corporations for the last decade, and I've been the nation's leading lawyer trying to fight to get employment rights for these workers, and I, and I launched a national conversation about the importance of that. Now, as a, how do I say this politely? But as a corporate exec, why would I do this? I'm on the hook. I mean, people like you are gonna, be smarter than me, quicker than me, and figure out that I'm not doing, if I'm supposed to pay somebody $100 and I only pay them 95 you're going to come after me personally, aren't you? Uh, yes, I, I will. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of corporations out there who think that it's a good business practice and they'll save money by not paying everything they owe because they don't think that anyone will come after them um, aggressively enough so that it's a cost of doing business. Um, it's important that our laws be aggressively enforced to, to keep companies from doing that, trying to shortchange not only their workers, but good businesses, complying competitors who are trying to do the right thing, shouldn't be getting undercut by those who would, who would skim uh, on labor costs. What are the odds of them getting away with it? Well, it depends on who's going after them. I've spent, I've spent more than 20 years aggressively going after these large corporations that have done that, um, and I'm proud to have recovered hundreds of millions of dollars that were stolen from working people. Um, but you need to have someone at the head of the AG's office who knows how to do that type of litigation, who knows how to lead teams of lawyers to enforce the law. Um, I'm the only candidate in the race that has that experience. Now, how big is the AG's office? There are several hundred attorney generals, assistant attorney generals, um, as well as lots of staff, investigators, um, paralegals, and other staff. So it's a sizable office. It has a number of divisions. So you do have a, a hundred or plus assistants that can help you with this? Yes, yes, that's right. I'm also the only candidate in this race who has run my own law firm. So uh, I know a little something about managing teams of lawyers. I've managed teams of lawyers at my own firm as well as others that I've worked with across the country. I've worked with other attorney general's offices across the country, including here in Massachusetts and other places like California, New York. Um, this is, um, again, it's, it's a serious office that requires someone who has been in the courts, who has done this type of legal work and knows how to use the legal system as a tool to, to improve people's lives. Is that the key to be efficient and good manager? Yes, that's a big part of it. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, when I think about, you, you mentioned a couple little companies like Uber. And I was reading that they did so well and everything's going great and they only lost two billion last quarter. <laughs> that's a B. That's uh -huh. billion. Yeah. So going up against somebody like that, mm -hmm. they would seem to have enough money to have a good defense set up. 
Yeah, well, I, you know, I've pretty much been having them run scared for a number of years now. Um, you know, and I've taken pride in advocating for people who've been taken advantage of by these multi-billionaire companies. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I started, uh, I started a series of cases uh, on behalf of gig workers, workers for companies like Uber and Lyft and others, um, and said that these workers deserve the rights of other workers um, to be free from discrimination on their jobs, to receive proper wages, to receive uh, at least a minimum wage and overtime and get reimbursed for their expenses. You know, what these companies do is they try to push all the expense of running a business onto the backs of their workers. So for instance, Uber is a car service, but it doesn't have to pay for any cars because it makes its drivers pay for all that, for their gas and the maintenance. And you know, it's a pretty good um, economic business model if you can get away with it, not having to invest in any of the tools of the, of the business and make, make your workers pay for it all. Expenses. Yes. And they're still losing two billion a quarter. But now, when we look, one of the biggest issues we have um, and I'm in a science company, an instrument company, is attracting good talent. If you're not paying fair wage, I mean, one of our friend's son went to work part-time at Amazon. He's making 20 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. Don't these gig companies have to compete? Um, yeah, I mean, the best way to, to compete, though, is to offer good pay and offer good benefits to their workers. And, you know, I know a little something about running a business, too, because, you know, not only have I run my law firm for, for years, um, I have a story that I'll tell about how I became an owner of a pizza shop. I took on a chain of pizza restaurants called the Upper Crust a number of years ago. Um, this company was found by the U.S. Department of Labor to be... Uh, not paying proper wages and overtime to their mostly immigrant workforce. Uh, so the Department of Labor ordered them to pay the money back, which they did. But then after the Department of Labor was out of the picture, they went around to all the workers and said, if you want to keep your jobs, you have to pay that money back to us because that's our money. Uh, so sure enough, they did. They made the workers pay the <coughs> money back to them either in cash or they deducted it from their future wages. The workers reached out to me, and I brought a class action lawsuit against the upper crust uh, and got a class certified on behalf of all the workers who had to make this choice between keeping their jobs or keeping their Department of Labor issued back pay. Um, case got a little uh, heated, and ultimately they filed for bankruptcy. I went to the bankruptcy auction with my husband, and we bought the Harvard Square location of the upper crust. We renamed it the Just Crust, and we ran it as a worker-friendly pizza shop for several years. How did that work out? Well, it was fun. Um, it, it was we had we had a fun few years. We showed that we could have um, serve pizza with a topping of justice, and it, we enjoyed it and served a really could good pie. Could you compete playing fairly? Well, I, part of why I wanted to do it was to show that you could that you could do it. You know that you don't have to. Um, it doesn't have to be on the backs of your workers. You got companies that are trying to do the right thing, businesses that are trying to play by the rules. And it's so important that we enforce these rules and these laws to make sure that the businesses who don't want to play by the rules don't get uh, an advantage and get to undercut the others. And that's what worries you the most is to say, okay, I'm a good guy. I want to be fair. I want to make money, but I want to be fair. But I can't compete if somebody else is trimming wages is trimming you know different rules yeah yeah absolutely so the cases that I've done through my career that have helped workers um, they also help those businesses trying to do the right thing and they also help all of us as taxpayers you know because the businesses that are cheating that are misclassifying their workers they are putting the burden on on all of us um, when they're not paying not into unemployment not paying into workers fair comp. Share of taxes well, they would never do that. Uh -huh. Well, you know, misclassifying workers is, is a pretty convenient way for businesses not to pay employer payroll taxes. So it does hurt all of us. And that's why I always wonder is, every time I think of trimming or cutting, you sit there and say, you know, there's gonna be a Shannon out there who's a little smarter, a little quicker, and she's gonna figure out that I did this. Well, 
Um, I, um, hopefully there will be, and that's why the voters of Massachusetts should elect me to be the next attorney general because I'll be on the lookout for, for the cheaters who think that they can take advantage of people, and not just workers, <coughs> but, but consumers. Uh, you know, there are bad actors out there that are engaged in all kinds of scams. Online scams are just exploding. Seniors are being taken advantage of. You've got price gougers who are taking advantage of difficult circumstances just to jack up prices of gas and, and other things. That, those are the kinds of things that the Attorney General can investigate and take action against. Now, how does the Attorney General find out? Is it tipped off or? Well, so the AG's office can take complaints. Um, and one thing that I've heard as I've been traveling all around Massachusetts and, and hearing what folks want to see more of from the AG's office is that people want the AG's office to be accessible. So right now, the AG's office is based in Boston. It has outposts in Springfield, Worcester, New Bedford. I think it's very important that we keep those outposts. And, and as AG, I would consider having more outposts so that the office is accessible to anyone to walk in the door um, and, and lodge their complaint. And if there's something that we can do about it, and if we see that there is a, a crop of complaints coming up in a certain area, I would investigate and take legal action if that's something that we can do something with. And this is what I've been doing through my law practice for years. We get thousands of calls from workers who say that their employers have been cheating them on their wages. And when we see a case that we can take on and investigate and do something about, we take it on. Um, for other folks, if there's not something we can do, we try to refer them in the right direction. So this is what the AG's office needs to do. But I would not just wait and be reactive for the complaints. I want to partner with community organizations, with labor unions, with other groups that will allow us to be proactive in finding out where the issues are and where the tools of our office can be now, can be you mentioned use. you have an outpost in New Beige. Portuguese speaking? Um, well, I would make sure that the AG's office is accessible to people who speak multiple languages um, and, and that when people call up and have a complaint, there needs to be someone on the other end of the line to take that complaint um, and do something with them and give them a response. So I would see to it that the AG's office has the staffing and the resources needed to, to be that uh, the people's law firm. Because that's one of the worries I've always had is I'm from a Portuguese heritage. Um, my grandfather came to Milford in 39, my mother in 41, but they didn't speak any English. So they were ripe for being, let's say, not treated fairly. But how would they, not speaking English, reach out to the AG's office and say, please help me? Uh, it's critical that the AG's office has a multilingual staff that can take those types of complaints. And, um, and through my career, I have represented people from all different backgrounds, different countries. Um, one of the lines of cases that I'm most proud of that I've done in my career is I took on a series of cases involving janitorial companies, large national janitorial companies that exploited vulnerable immigrant workers, many of whom did not speak English. And they sold them on this idea that they could have the American dream. They could run their own business. They sold them what they called cleaning franchises. Um, but I heard a lot of complaints working with the Brazilian Immigrant Center in Boston. I talked with a lot of these workers and realized that what was really happening was they were being charged thousands of dollars for the privilege of cleaning office buildings in um, in greater Boston and around Massachusetts. So case by case, I took on a series of cases and I won. I took it up to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court who agreed with me that selling a job is illegal in Massachusetts. And after that, these companies stopped doing this in Massachusetts. So that, that's the type of work that I would do as Attorney General. Now, when you start down this road, you know, you say you protect consumers and you combat fraud. A lot of the press we hear about is that seniors, a lot of them are alone. I mean, my family was very fortunate that my darling bride invited my mother to live with us for the last 30 years of her life. So mom always had family around her. But you hear over and over how many seniors are 
I guess, left alone? It's, it's, a, re it's a real crisis. Um, I was really glad to, in my visit to Milford today, I visited the Milford Senior Center. Um, I've got wonderful facilities there. Uh, they showed me around and all of the opportunities for, for engagement. And it's, it's so important for people to have that social contact. It's, it's important to health. It's just it's it's important as an equity issue, and I think there is a real risk that 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 seniors are taken advantage of. You know, there are a lot of scammers out there who will use their isolation and vulnerability to call them up on the phone and start talking to them. Um, you know, and then trick them into buying something they didn't mean to buy. Well, they're um, desperate for attention. Mm -hmm. Some nice young lady or nice young man talks nicely to them. And so many of these seniors seem to want to trust. Right. So, so it's important that we have protections out there um, after those bad actors who will take advantage of, of vulnerable people. And that's what I will do as Attorney General. Can the AG's office get back the money? Or, I mean, once it's gone, you'd think these people just disappear in the night. Well, I mean, I, I've spent a, a lot of time through these 20 years going after bad actors, chasing down employers who, who try those kinds of scams, you know, to then slip away in the dead of night. And I've seen so many different ways that um, corporations have tried to get away with not paying, and then they play games, and then they change ownership. And so there are a lot of legal tools we have to go after these bad actors, and I will put those to work as Attorney General. Is it, is it mainly corporations that you're chasing or is it individuals? It's mainly corporations. I mean, of course, there are, you know, there are all types of bad actors out there who will take advantage of people. But um, I have seen that the, the parties that have the biggest resources to, to take advantage of people on a broad scale typically are corporations and a lot of larger corporations in particular. So that has been a big focus of mine in my And they career. believe they can get away with it. They think they can get away with it because they have the power and the resources to, um, to defend themselves. And so that, that's why I have relished through my career taking it on the other side of the fight, fighting for sticking up for regular people and making sure that, that they have representation. Um, th that's why I went to law school to represent regular people and, and try to make a difference in people's lives. And I knew that these, these big corporations have the money to pay for high-priced legal counsel. And I thought it was important that working people, regular people, have uh, strong representation as well. So that's, that's why I went down this well, path. It's, it's hard to believe, and I'm so happy that you've been successful that somebody that's a custodian who just came from Rio or Sao Paulo can take on a big company. Exactly, exactly. I, I've been so proud and honored to work for workers, um, to fight for them. Um, so many of my clients have said that, um, you know, they didn't know that they could do that. They didn't know they could take on these big corporations. A um, number of years ago, I took on a series of cases against all of the major airlines on behalf of Skycaps. Those are the workers who stand outside. Poor guys out in the, the guys and girls out in the cold holding the bags. Out in the cold, checking passengers in on their way in, um, giving them their boarding passes before we were doing it all on our phones. Um, you know, and helping them with their bags, just getting their bags out of their car and uh, you know and checked in. Um, and so the sky caps had traditionally made all of their money by tips that customers left them. Yes. Um, and then one day, you know, the, the airlines were complaining about how much they had to pay on fuel and they were nickel and diming everywhere and they realized there's all this cash changing hands and passengers were paying tips to these sky caps. And so that someone came up with this brilliant idea of putting a big sign at the curb saying, curbside check-in, $2 per bag. And all the customers looked at it and they said, oh, okay, so we used to be able to tip just if we wanted to. Now we have to tip $2 a bag. And little did they know, that money wasn't going to the workers. It was going straight into the coffers of American Airlines, United Airlines, U.S. Airlines. Really? So I brought cases against all of these airlines. Um, we went to trial against American Airlines and won a jury trial. Um, it was a fantastic victory. Um, David and Goliath battle like I've been doing through my career. And we got all of the airlines that, that we took on um, uh, to, to drop that $2 charge. Now, you were doing this with your private law firm. Yes. 
And you had the resources to take them on? Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I've been doing, fighting for the little guy. Yeah, I've really loved taking on these cases where they are David and Goliath battles. I have done many, many of them through my career. And, um, and, and that's why I'm the most qualified to be the Attorney General. I mean, look at what I've done with my moderate-sized law firm, and imagine what I can do with having hundreds of Attorney Generals well, at... I was, was going to say, you've got a pea, pea shooter and you're taking on these people. We'll give you a howitzer. Who knows what you could get done? Um, I, I look forward to the opportunity. Because I was going to ask, it's got to be a monumental decision to leave a lucrative private practice and go into, a, I guess, fulfilling but not so lucrative uh, government job. Yeah, I you know I've been doing this work for more than twenty years. I feel like I have gained experience and skills and have a passion for this line of work and I, I'm so excited about the possibility of continuing on this work for the people of Massachusetts. I, I got my start right after law school, um, no actually right after college. My first job was working with the, the legendary feminist leader Bella Abzug um, and that's where that's where this all began. You know I watched her, I saw her take on big challenges um, she was never deterred. She, ha she saw a wrong that needed to be righted and she said, here's what we're going to do, let's go do it. Um, and I took that, um, that vision and that advocacy and that, uh, that optimism into my legal career and I knew that that was the type of work I wanted to do. And I, I'm at the stage of my career now where I am excited about being able to expand on this work to all of the different areas touched by the AG's office to really fight for all the people of Massachusetts. How would you rate our current AG? I think Mara Healy has done a fantastic job. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to step into her shoes and continue and expand on really important work she's been doing. She's taken on a number of pharmaceutical companies who have brought us the opioid crisis. It's very important work, but it's far from finished. This is the type of impact high stakes litigation that I've been doing for more than 20 years. I am the best candidate to continue on with it. She's also taken on Exxon um, for lying to us for decades about the impact that fossil fuels have had on climate change. Um, there's a lot more work to be done there, and Exxon is not the only bad actor in that area. So I look forward to uh, continuing on this important work. I mean, it's amazing what got done against the Sackler family. When you think of $11 billion squirreled away in I mean, we've had so, so different reactions. I mean, when we grew up, I think of when we were kids, you thought of a heroin addict. It was a shady person in the back alley shooting up. And all of a sudden you look and it's your neighbor's daughter, or your neighbor's son, that got hooked on pain medication. Yeah, the, the opioid crisis has just been devastating to families to communities, and it, and it didn't just happen. Um, there, there were corporations out there that were making billions of dollars off of selling these uh, highly potent painkillers, and they knew, they knew how addictive they were. Um, and you know, and it's not, it's not just the pharmaceutical companies themselves, just today, um, a verdict was announced against Walgreens, um, which was helping also with, with distributing um, these products that has caused so much crisis through our communities. Um, so that is the type of work that the AG's office can and should be taking on, um, and I look forward to continuing on with that important battle you to get know, resources back to people who need it. The claim is they didn't know that certain physicians were abusing it. Well, the statistics would bite you in the keister when you start saying one physician in South Carolina was prescribing it 3,000 percent or 3,000 times more than the demographics would call for. How can you not know if you're a pharmacy? I, I think there's been some pretty damning evidence that's come out from the lawsuits that have already been filed and, and, and there are a lot more bad actors out there and, and it's not just the pharmaceutical industries and the, and the chains like Walgreens but there are also corporations out there who are now taking advantage of people who are trying to go into recovery. Who uh, There are these sober homes that offer themselves as a space where people can um, get sober 
and recover. Um, and they're, they're, they're exploiting people and they're not providing the services, the safe environment that they're promising to. Those are also the types of actors that an attorney general can go after and make sure that they're not taking advantage of people who are in a very vulnerable position. Didn't it seem ironic that the Sacklers were trying to um, sell a treatment to get you off o opioids? So the left hand is promoting mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and the right hand is trying to make money on taking people down. Right, and then at the same time, we have a criminal justice system which has been trying to prosecute its way out of um, um, addiction um, and punish people. Who have who have gotten hooked on these very very powerful products? Um, um, I have a cousin actually who's a professor who has been writing about this for years, even before the litigation started against the pharmaceutical industry, about the connections between illegal drugs and legal drugs, and how there hasn't really been that much difference. It's just that um, black and brown communities have largely been um, incarcerated for their use of what were called illegal drugs um, through this country's failed war on drugs. Um, and now we have these, these other types of pharmaceuticals that companies have made billions of dollars in the legal market selling and pushing that has brought about such a crisis. And there's really quite an irony there. So I think it's very important that, um, that we don't use our criminal justice system to try to prosecute our way out of these issues. There are addiction is a serious matter. People need resources and help. Well, again, when you think of who's being affected, it's not the shady people in the back alleys of Boston, although they need help too, but it's normal people. It's kids who hurt themselves playing sports in their local high school who got addicted. There, this is, this is uh, an issue of, of enormous impact that is still continuing to affect our communities, um, our families every day. And, and it's one that I look forward to continuing the important battle Mara Healy has been fighting to, uh, to try to get justice, to stop these companies from, from doing this and to um, use the recoveries from that litigation to get to get the help to the people who need it. Seems like with a six to three shift in the Supreme Court, the world is changing. I mean, I think before we get to the big one, gun control. Is there anything the AG the office gets involved with in gun control? Well, I mean, there's been so much that the Supreme Court has done, I mean, has been doing for years, but this term in particular, the Supreme Court has been tearing down our rights. And um, one of those areas was um, um, challenging states that have enacted strong gun safety protections. I mean, here in Massachusetts, we have not experienced as much gun violence as has been, happened in a lot of other parts of the country because we have such strong laws here. I have three children. Um, every time I've heard about one of these mass shootings okay. happen, I have just, my stomach drops. It's just a punch in the gut. Um, we need to be sure to continue to protect our families and our communities. And, and this is what I had mentioned before, that I've spent my career figuring out ways around bad Supreme Court decisions. So that's what we have to do here. We have to make sure that we have laws in place in Massachusetts to continue to protect, to protect our communities. Um, and as Attorney General, I will make sure that those laws are enforced. And um, a lot of times that involves doing something in the, in the state legal system that protects our rights on the state level, even if they're not recognized anymore on the federal level. Well, a lot of the impact people don't even directly feel. Um, a few years ago, we changed the police budget to add an internal SWAT team because we were scared to death when we saw the statistics that we could get our regional response to Milford within 38 minutes, but the average shooting was done in 18. I didn't want to be cold, but it's like, isn't that a little, late? you have kids, I don't care about the school, you know, I worry about the kids in the school. 
So we put up $600,000 to have police officers that can respond within a couple minutes. But that hits our budget. That's money we don't have for other things that we'd like to do. You know, and you sit there and say, what can Massachusetts do? Is it to keep our strong gun laws? Is it to expand them? Well, I think the legislature has already taken an important step toward responding to the Supreme Court's decision. And it's not completely clear how that decision would affect Massachusetts law because the New York law that it addressed is somewhat different. But I think it's clear that under the Supreme Court decision, the legislature can spell out more specific requirements that, that police departments can look at in deciding who is lawfully entitled to have a gun license. So we're already on our way toward responding to that decision, um, and I think it's very important we have an attorney general who understands the, the legal nuances to make sure that our safety is protected here, despite the Supreme Court's complete disregard for the safety of our families and communities. Now, you know, again, I'm a gun owner. I own a shotgun that I bought when I was a teenager, and that I, I don't think I've touched it in 20 years, but I remember when the trigger guard law came out. I went out and bought a trigger guard. I remember when they said you should lock your gun away so no children can get near it. I locked it away. So, you know, there's things that I do as a good gun owner. Um, but I don't understand the logic sometimes of having to buy a gun the day I want to. And Shannon, it would scare me to death if you came in and said, I need to buy a gun today. Why the urgency today? Right. And, the, and there are certain guns that are being sold that, uh, you know, that are not needed by, um, you know, it's one thing if you're, uh, you're a sportsman or a hunter, uh, I mean, but there are certain weapons that are getting into the hands of people in our communities that there's just really no explanation for why they need them. And a huge problem that we've been seeing is uh, the rise of ghost guns. This is something that I would crack down on as Attorney General. So these are guns that are manufactured in parts so that they're not traceable. Un Unserialized. Yes, yes. It's, it's a big problem. It's a big concern. I don't, again, if I'm a legal gun owner, I mean, this whole thing about these big magazines and all, we used to go deer hunting. I had three shells. That was it for the week end. I never thought I'd show, shoot all three. The idea that I'm, that I'm Pancho Villa with 20 or 30 never made any sense to me. Well, you know, again, I, I just don't think the Supreme Court has been, you know, living in the reality that we're all living in. Um, you know, and we've seen it with a series of decisions that just came out over the last couple of months. Um, uh, you know, I. I've been a women's rights activist since the beginning of my career right out of college and I was just shocked and dumbfounded that the Supreme Court would take away our right to choose on a national level. Well, so, let's talk about the effect of Roe v. Wade to Massachusetts. Yeah, well, so here in Massachusetts, we're very fortunate that we have a legislature that codified the right to abortion in the Roe Act um, before this horrendous decision by the Supreme Court. But there is still a lot that needs to be done to make sure that abortion services and reproductive health care is available and accessible to people throughout Massachusetts. There's also going to be an influx of people coming into Massachusetts from other states. Um, I plan to be a leader among attorneys general to ensure um, safe, accessible reproductive health care and right to abortion services. and. It is critical that we have an attorney general who understands um, where the legal landscape is. You know, we're about to see unprecedented legal battles like we have never seen before in this country, where you're going to have the red states are going to be trying to come into states like Massachusetts and enforce their bans here. As attorney general, I will, uh, I will protect patients. I will protect abortion providers to make sure that they are not um, being deterred. Um, and that they're not being threatened, and that those states are not going to be able to enforce their laws here in Massachusetts. But even some of the far-reaching effects, like when you see people protesting abortion services, now all of a sudden it's reaching out to IVF clinics. I, 
I have friends who said they harvested 32 eggs. They do them in cohorts. Well, once they got pregnant, the second time, they were done. Well, there's now still 16 embryos sitting in cryo storage that technically you can't thaw. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are huge ramifications from the Supreme Court's decision, um, you know, that go, you know, well beyond the, the basic issue of a person's right to choose uh, and their bodily autonomy. Um, there's so many types of repercussions that are still, that are going to be an issue. Um, you see doctors who are worried about carrying on their practices because, you know, they're worried about what type of liability they might incur um, when they're in a situation where they have a patient whose, whose health and safety is at risk. Uh, again, these are, these are very pertinent, important legal issues that are going to be playing out in our courts. We need to have someone at the Attorney General's office who knows how to take on the legal system and protect our rights. Isn't here. that one of the most basic decisions? I remember when my darling bride was pregnant, and we did the amnio, and they said there is an equal chance of coming up with Down syndrome as a miscarriage due to the amnio. And when the results came back, I had to look up and say, please don't make me make this decision. Because to me, there was no more fundamental decision than right there, that the two of us, really it's her decision, but I would like to think I had a part in it. You know, it's like, I got a problem with somebody from a square state telling me how to manage my family. Yes. Well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And, and, that's, and that's what we're seeing now. Um, these are personal decisions um, that, that people should have the right to choose their bodily autonomy. This is what I've been fighting for ever since I you know, was first in college and was marching for reproductive rights. I worked at the Center for Reproductive Law and Policy while I was in college, when I was in law school, um, helped defending um, abortion rights across the country. Um, it, it is so sad and, and heartbreaking to me today. I now have a 17-year-old daughter to think that she and uh, others her age are, are coming of age at a time when they have less rights um, than I had and, and my cohorts had as we were coming of age in this country. Do you think there's a chance that other states can impose their will on us? Well, we know that they're going to try. But as Attorney General here in Massachusetts, I'm not, I'm Shannon, not going to let I can them. try and be young, thin, and have hair. <laughs> At the end of the day, the mirror is going to show a fat old bald man. The question is, what chance do they have? Well, part of what the legislature has already done um, is um, passed a law that has, that has strengthened our, our rights here, even beyond the Roe Act that had been passed before. Um, and one of the issues is not allowing states to come in um, and and try to to prosecute people here in Massachusetts for engaging in activities that are perfectly legal here in Massachusetts. And again, the laws that we have on the books by our legislature are only as good as they are enforced, which is comes back again back to, to the my AG. to the AG's role is is to know how to use the legal system to enforce our rights, enforce our laws. I am the candidate in this race who knows how to do that because I've been doing it for my whole career. Let's shift over to the environment. A lot of talk about fossil fuels. Yes. What's your position? Yeah, well, I mean, climate change is, is a critical threat to all of us. I plan to be the nation's leading attorney general to fight climate change. Once again, our legislature has put some good laws on the books. Um, we now have a next generation roadmap to help get us to where we need to be in fighting climate change, but laws don't enforce themselves. I will take on those powerful interests. I will use the same skills and energy and passion that I put into representing my clients through my legal career and use that to fight polluters who have um, who've disregarded our laws. Um, taking on corporations like Exxon that have lied to us for decades about their impact on climate change. And I plan to set up a green bank where we will take penalties that we recover from these, these big corporations, these massive polluters, and use those funds to fund clean energy projects and environmental justice projects. How do we get there without, I mean, when I look at some of the claims that we're going to stop fossil fuels and gasoline goes up to five bucks a gallon, 
I mean, that hurts the, the little people. I mean, if I'm making a million, two million, five million a year, eh, okay, got an extra dollar to a gallon, I probably can weather that storm. But how do you get over to a green environment and not bankrupt all the people who are making 30 grand a year or 40 grand a year? Well, um, as, as a society, we need to make the choice to invest in the change, for one thing. I, I strongly believe that getting to where we need to get to on our emissions reductions and fighting climate change is not something that should be on the backs of individuals, particularly individuals who are trying to, you know, pay to feed themselves and their families and, you know, they need their cars now to get to work. It's, it's not something that's going to be addressed through an individual by individual decision. We need to have societal change that is going to allow us to get to where we need to be. We need to be investing in public transportation so that more people have a way to get to work and where they need to be without driving their individual cars. We need to be doing everything we can to, uh, to encourage getting electric vehicles out there and accessible um, and affordable for people. Um, so the, there is a lot that we need to do to invest in clean energy sources and solar and wind and geothermal and importantly also as we are making this conversion to a green economy we cannot let those corporations that are that that provide power in this country to use us as an excuse to take away good paying jobs um, and fair pay and fair benefits we need to provide resources and training for the workers whose work is going to be displaced by this transition um, and make sure that they have access to uh, there, there's a wealth of green jobs that are going to be created by this transition uh, i want to see to it i'm going to advocate in every way possible to ensure that this is a just transition and that those workers aren't left out in the cold and they have good paying jobs with good benefits and strong union protection now, one of the things you have to worry about when you have big inflation, big changes, is people who are taking advantage, the gougers. Yes. What can the AG do? Um, well, that is exactly something that the AG's office can do. And in fact, I have um, a consumer protection plan that's on my website now. Um, and I will take on uh, and investigate and take on those price gougers who will take advantage of a situation to, to hike up prices um, just because they can. Um, it, it's hurting working families, it's hurting our pocketbooks, those people who are you know, trying to pay for the, uh, the high cost of everything these days. Um, it's just, that's unacceptable behavior. Well, I mean, our high school, which is hard to accept, but it's reality. Almost 50% of our kids are on free lunch, which means their family of four is making less than $35,000 a year. I can't imagine there's much room to absorb this inflation and everything. They just seem more vulnerable. Uh, that is the number one issue that I've heard from voters as I've been crisscrossing the state is just the high price of everything now, the, you know, the price of housing, the price of basic necessities, the price of raising a family, that's what's on people's minds. And what better way for starters to make sure people have enough money in their pocket to pay for the costs of everything than first of all make sure they're getting every penny in their pocket that they're owed by their employers. And that's where our, the wage enforcement comes in, the work that I've been doing for 20 years to get millions of dollars back into working people's pockets. Um, we haven't talked so much about housing prices. That was uh, coming up next is housing. So let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, my plan as Attorney General is to establish an office of the housing advocate, uh, ho office of the tenant advocate that would advocate for tenants, provide representation to tenants in, in housing courts. Right now, at uh, housing courts, pretty much you go in and the landlords have representation and the tenants don't. So it's not an even playing field. Um, this office would provide support and resources for tenants so that our housing courts just aren't eviction mills um, and provide them with support and resources so they can stay in their homes. Um, another big problem related to housing is the ongoing problem we have here in Massachusetts of lead paint. Um, so much it's of our housing stock 
is still contaminated with lead paint and we have some laws from the 1970s that didn't do their job. The idea was to try to get as many housing units deleaded as possible, but what these laws actually did instead was lead to rampant discrimination against families with children under the age of six because landlords haven't wanted to de-lead properties. Instead, they've wanted to just keep out families from, from moving into those uh, homes. So what we need to do, and um, I will advocate strongly with the legislature to get our laws fixed so that we actually fix this problem because it's, a, it's not just a housing issue, it's an equity issue, it's a health issue, it's an educational issue because children who are um, who have lead paint poisoning? It's still it's still an enormous issue, and it affects wow. uh, families of color. You never hear about that anymore. It's still an issue out there. How do you balance? Because what I worry about, I mean, when I grew up, the price of a home in Milford was affordable. I mean, we just had a house go nine hundred thousand dollars in Milford. When we were a kid, you could have bought Milford for 900 They would have thrown in Hopedale, maybe Mendon on top of it. But with the price that you can get for a house, if you squeeze the rents too much, doesn't that kind of push landlords to sell the houses? Mm. Well, I mean, I think there, there are different ways to take on the issue. Um, you know, I think there's a lot more that can be done just to, to provide assistance to people who, so that they can stay in their homes. There, um, you know, there are huge discrimination issues in the housing market as well that I would take on as attorney general. So um, there, you know, there are ways for, um, you know, for landlords to make a go of it um, without having to, to raise prices so high that, that working families can't afford to live. I don't know how they can afford it now when I see one bedroom apartments for $1,300. I mean, you think of Boston, the North End. Yes, it's $3,000 for an apartment. And being this far out, we say, yeah, but that's Boston. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know. yeah, but, but prices are going up everywhere. Um, and we need to be building more affordable housing. Part of the issue is that we just don't have enough housing. And we also need to make sure that it's accessible on public transportation so people can be living further outside of Boston, still get it to the jobs where, uh, you know, where the economic opportunity is. But we need more housing. That was the hardest thing to get used to when my wife and I moved back from Paris. We didn't have a car for two years because the trains were everywhere. And then all of a sudden, if I want to go shopping, I need my car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, but will public transportation go beyond 128? I, we, I, I believe strongly that we need to be investing in it. We need to be investing in public transportation in the cities and also outside the cities. Um, West-East Rail, North-South Rail, we need to be making it easier for people to get around without having to have an individual car. Um, and it's also a reason why I'm a strong supporter of the Fair Share Amendment, which is going to be on our ballot in November, because that will provide an ongoing source of funding for our transportation systems as well as for our schools, our educational system. Explain fair share. Sure. So it is um, an amendment to the Consti state constitution that is going to be on the ballot this November. Um, this has been an ongoing effort, um, and it looks like this year it is within striking distance. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of it. Um, it would impose an additional 4% um, surtax on incomes over a million dollars to pay for public transportation, to pay for our transportation system, to pay for public education. Um, and it's and it's an ongoing source of support for these sorely needed public public needs. But now, if somebody's paying millions of dollars in taxes, can I really say they're not paying their fair share? Well, I mean, if you compare it to you know folks who are who are trying to get by, you know, who are trying to support a family, who are um, you know regular folks, um, low income, mid income. Um, you know, they need every penny in their pocket. Those who are more fortunate and have incomes over a million, they can afford to pay a little more um, to our common benefit. See, that I'll buy. The idea of saying they're not paying their fair share, I don't know of many people paying millions of dollars a year, and I don't know I could look at them with a straight face saying, you're not paying your fair share. But saying we need to get the money from somewhere, and you can't squeeze it out of people making 30 or 40 grand a year. 
Yeah, right, right, absolutely. So, so this is an additional source of funding, which, which is crucial to uh, the viability of our, our public education system and our transportation. So if we can just talk about education for a moment. I'm a strong supporter of public education. Um, I have come from a family, public school teachers, my mother, my grandmother, my brother, my cousins, my mother-in-law. Um, so I, I'm a big supporter of public education. I don't support raising um, caps on charter schools and diverting more public money into charter schools. I believe that our schools should be accountable to locally elected school boards and they should have strong union representation for the educators who, who work with our children every day. I'd love to keep going, but we've hit that time where I've got to say, Shannon, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? You should vote for me for Attorney General because I will fight for you and I will win. I have spent my career taking on the most powerful interests in America, championing regular people. I have used our legal system to make people's lives better. I have put hundreds of millions of dollars back in the pockets of working people. I'm the only candidate in this race who, have, who has used the legal system that way, who has shaped the law case by case to give a fair shot to regular people. Um, I'm not afraid of anyone. I relish the opportunity to stand up to powerful interests and fight on behalf of all the people of Massachusetts. Um, I, I would be humbled and honored to have your support and the support of your listeners. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed my visit to Milford today. I spent some time at the Senior Center. I visited the firefighters who do important work every day keeping us all safe. Um, so I, I thank you for letting me be here, and I would ask everyone to please take a look at our website, Shannon4AG.com. That's Shannon4FORAG.com. Um, as we're in the final weeks now of this primary, I've been traveling all around Massachusetts, and I'm really excited about the energy we're picking up. People are hearing the message and are agreeing we need a seasoned, experienced lawyer running the AG's office, and I would be proud and honored to, to serve as the people's lawyer for the next four years. Well, I have to admit, I don't want to downplay what you've done as a guerrilla fighter, you know, a small legal agency against big corporations, but having you the head of the Army be really interesting to see what you could accomplish. Well, thank you. And as always, I thank you for tuning in. I always promised I'd never ask you to vote for a specific candidate. But I beg you, and I'll beg you again, to get out and vote. In the spring, we had 9% turnout. we got to do better than that. you got to come out, learn about the candidates, find out which one you feel is most like us, who will support us, and who will do good things for us. And then get out and vote. And as always, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better night than tonight. Thank you, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Not too long since I've been home